AI can even help a developer in the first stage of a design process to already generate some design ideas and generate, for example, the, the perfect volume, adjusted the fabric mm -hmm. design by wind, by shadow, acoustics. So for the first phase, maybe very soon, you don't really need an architect. In these times of fast change, have you ever thought architecture might be falling a bit short and wondered what's next? Well, let's find out. My name is Luca De Stefano, I'm one of the founders of Known A, and this is Boundary Breaking Businesses Beyond Architecture. Designers and commissioners of tomorrow speaking today. Episode 9 Real Estate Crash Course. Hello, everyone, and welcome back at Beyond Architecture. Today, we talk about real estate. I mean, most of us know real estate developers are one of the main clients for architects. So it's important that we focus on understanding how their processes work, what they're looking for when it comes to working with architects, and what new opportunity might arise in the future. Our guest from today has been a real estate developer in the Netherlands for almost 10 years. He comes from a bachelor degree in architecture and then for his master's he made a switch. So it's kind of interesting to see what's the story behind that. And besides that, he has been involved in major projects. Today he works in Form, which is one of the largest real estate developers and operators and constructors of real estate projects in the Netherlands. So there is quite a big portfolio and expertise we can access through this conversation. Without further ado, we connect with Rotterdam, the Netherlands, because at Beyond Architecture, we talk with Derek van der Berg. Oh, one small note. Derek actually recorded in a meeting room next to a river. So you will hear a bit of humming, like a buzz going through. Yeah, just keep in mind, it's a river. We try to get it out of the way, but we managed to a certain extent. Well, welcome, Derek. Welcome at Beyond Architecture. How are you today? I'm great. I mean, I'm talking with you, so <laughs> we didn't talk for a long time, so I'm great. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. so nice to catch up. I'm actually using this podcast to reconnect with people that are doing interesting stuff and that I normally don't talk to. So it's, it's turning out quite useful, I have to say. And uh, well, we have to talk about the big uh, R word, the real estate, which for many architects is a, is a big mystery, sometimes an enemy, sometimes a great friend. An ugly word, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I feel there is a lot of prejudice towards real estate developers in general. So it, it could be very useful if we take a moment to explain a bit who is a real estate developer? What do you guys do? What, is, what type of projects do you develop? And what's the role of architects in that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, maybe to start, this is very interesting. I lately read the research that the real estate developer is the profession people in the Netherlands trust the least. Who trust the least? Yeah, so only 4% of the people trust the real estate developer. And then number two is actually <laughs> the second-hand car seller. So we're below the second-hand car seller. <laughs> so we have love, we have quite yeah we have quite some work to do I, I guess yeah I I love this research uh, it, was there a survey like were they going around and asking people do you know how many expressed uh, no I, I I I think I read it on Twitter like half a year ago and I it, I was not surprised I should say because I always have to explain in my family also what I'm doing and people that don't know what a real estate developer does usually think it's connected to the mafia or you know that there's a lot of criminality involved and it, it really has a bad name. And uh, it's a shame because I think we do a lot of good. Yeah, I agree. Shall we go through it then? Like, can you tell us yeah. in simple words, how does it work? What does a real estate developer do? Yeah, well, a real estate developer uh, basically is the, the person that connects all the stakeholders in the design process to, in the end, realize the building. And so we're uh, connecting the, the people in the design team, the architect, the construction advisor, the installation advisor, and so on. But we're also the link between the design team, the municipality, and the investor, uh, etc. So basically, we're in charge of the whole. Okay, and this whole process, where does it start? Who gets the first idea of saying, "Oh, this plot is interesting. I would like to do something." It could be anyone. It could be uh, uh, ourselves, but it could be also a building owner that has a problem that says, "Look, I have a four-story office building, but doesn't really rent out very well." And I would like to research if they can redevelop it in a 10-story uh, house. But it could also be an architect. Many times we get approached by an architect that have an idea, 
uh, and they probably also have the knowledge to design it, but they don't have the resources. So then they go okay. to the real estate developer. Okay, interesting. So you start from this initial idea um, or initial opportunity, let's call it. And what are the first steps? Like, what do you first have to do to assess if this opportunity is valid? Well, normally it depends, of course, uh, for everyone. Everyone does it in a different way, but I usually do a quick scan. So I usually, uh, I look in the, the cadastre, you know, to see who owns it, who owns the plot adjacent to this plot. Uh, what does the zoning plan say and what is allowed to construct that specific plot? I try to do a bit of research to the current owner, like, uh, is it a legal company? Or, mm -hmm. And what, what type of business are they? Uh, can I find some information about their balances? Do they have a lot of money or they have little money? Uh, and then, of course, I, even though I'm a real estate developer, I do like design. I did study architecture also. So I, I, I usually mess a bit in SketchUp and I try to see what could be possible, you know, with a certain uh, surface on the plot and a certain amount of repetition. And then out of that SketchUp, I can make immediately a business case. So I can immediately say, okay, I can make 10,000 square meters, for example. Uh, it's all housing. Uh, let's say the average house is 80 square meters. How much would it cost me more or less? And how much would it yield? What would it be the revenues? And based on that, you have a bit of an idea. And uh, hmm. me, I'm a developer, so I'm not the only one of the company where I work. So in the end, I also need to convince the directors and the investors behind the company that it is an interesting opportunity. And I can only do that when I did proper research. I can show what is possible inside the zoning plan, uh, how it more or less looks like uh, with a sketchup uh, model, but also what will be the business case. Okay, and all this you do by yourself. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And uh, I hear then that the architectural background you, you got in your bachelor's really helped in this yeah, process. It does help. It, it does help. Yeah. We actually hire a lot of architects. In, inside your company directly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what do they do? Like, what's their task then to, to kind of mold these initial models? Um, yeah, well, we have uh, two different departments inside development. We have concept development and real estate development. Uh, usually, when we hire an architect, they start working as concept developer hmm. because in the end, the architects are usually creative people. Uh, so the concept developers, they really make the first plans, so the plans for acquisition, or we participate a lot in tenders. Uh, there, you need to have a lot of creativity. Once we have the project, uh, uh, we acquire the project, right? so once we have it, it usually goes to the Department of Real Estate Development, and then the developer works it out completely until the, the realization and the, the finishing. Okay. Now I have to be very disciplined because there is already three different questions that I want to ask you at the same time, okay. and I need to yeah. pick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay let, let's stay personal for a second. Um, because you mentioned that sometimes you still have fun designing things around. Do you miss sometimes your architect uh, kind of side? Like, would you would you like to be an architect for a day or something like that? Um, I would only like to be an architect for a day if I would be the partner of the group. <laughs> the I boss. would not like to be, yeah, I would not like to be, for example, the guy that enters and only can make floor plans. Yeah. Because in the end, the world of architecture is quite uh, hierarchical. Mm -hmm. it. And when you enter, you usually start with, very, with a very limited scope. And I like big scope. That's why I'm a developer. I like doing the whole plan. So, yeah, if I could be, for example, in Poas for a day, uh, I think it would be great fun because then you're in super interesting meetings. Uh, everyone listens to you and your ideas. But if you are the one just making the floor plan and drawing lines, uh, you know, that would not be my, uh, my thing. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I feel, though, Derek, that AI might soon wipe away all this type of jobs, like... I have the feeling that if architects want to survive, especially after all the conversations we had in this podcast, I believe we, we might have to all have a bit of an helicopter view of what we do. We cannot be any more a draftsman and a, and a partner thinking, you know? That's completely true. No, no, I, I, I actually think uh, exactly the same because AI can even help a developer in the first stage of a design process to already generate some design ideas and generate, for example, the, the perfect volume Adjusted uh, with parametric design by wind, mm -hmm. by shadow, acoustics. So, for the first phase, maybe very soon, you don't really need an architect. But I think the added value of an architect is that it can work it out and it can be an ambassador of the idea. You know? So, uh, 
An architect is trusted way more than a real estate developer. Let's just be honest, it's like that. So when we go to a municipality and the architect presents the plan to the urban design department, mm-hmm. it, it's taken way more seriously than if I would design it. If it would be generated by AI and I would design uh, present it, then I would probably not be taken seriously and they would be very suspicious. Okay. But the architect conveys a certain amount of trust. You know? Like architects are trusted. And I think uh, they know how to present also the ideas really good. So I think that's the future of the architects. It's not really drawing the lines anymore, which is, of course, part of the job nowadays, but soon probably not anymore. But it's mm-hmm. really about how can I be the ambassador of the idea as good as possible. Okay. Yeah, I you, you while you were talking, I was thinking about my first years in architecture. And I remember clearly doing some of these quick scans, as you call them, like developer came with a plot and with some numbers and said, what can we do with these numbers? And I was there modeling units and doing three or four different volumetric studies. If I understand you right, what you're telling me is, guys, most likely this type of assignments is not going to be there quite soon. No, because uh, first of all, we as developers, we also become more handy, you know, with tools. Mm-hmm. So uh, in Cyform, we, we actually hire a lot of architects. So they usually know how to work with Sketcher. They can Photoshop. Them. So a few first quick scans we can most of the time do ourselves. Uh, and secondly, AI is going to be a huge help. You know. So uh, the architect, in my opinion, you will always need an architect because you need someone with really the knowledge you need the lead of the design team, the architect who needs the lead of the design team. Mm-hmm. So I know uh, what the financial resource needs to be. I know what we need to align with the municipality and how to get everyone on board. But I don't know how to lead the design team the way an architect does. Because the architect also understands all the other disciplines usually very well. And I understand only a little. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the, the architect is the lead of the design team and is the investor of the idea towards external stakeholders such as municipalities. And that will be, I think, the main, uh, main role. Okay, that, that's already quite a big lesson. Huh? Like, if we focus more on brokering ideas once they are already over this initial phase, then it's a lot more about managing stakeholders, about, uh, of course, yes. developing the design more in detail, but also about presenting and being this ally of the real estate developer in uh, in becoming the ambassador of the project, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and I think nowadays in architecture, you see that only the partners take that role. Yeah, yeah. Or the, the, the managing architects, really the, the, the guys that are already quite high in the, uh, in the tree, etc. Like mm-hmm. um, but I think even junior architects in the, in the future will have to take that role. Maybe not with the amount of responsibility that a partner takes, obviously, but uh, it, it will be their role because everything else will be automated. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Um, going back to the process, um, just to make sure I understand everything right. So there is this initial phase, quick scan, and in this quick scan, you kind of get an assumption of how profitable or non-profitable this plot would be. Once you have something interesting, you go to your bosses, and they give you green light to proceed with investing more effort and money in uh, in this type of project, correct? Yeah, yeah. So um, we have, but that's really related to our company, at home. We have a quick scan. Once that gets a green light, we go into really the acquisition phase. Okay. It could be it could be a tender, so a tender are usually organized by municipalities, or it could be a, a one-to-one. So basically, a building owner that wants to sell his plot or wants to do uh, co-development with us, and usually we uh, we uh, organize a time frame, let's say three months, in which we need to come to a deal. So either we get to a deal with the, the building owner or the tender simply finishes, and we know if we want it or not. And inside those two or three months, we organize three moments. We call it bronze, silver, and gold. Okay. And during those three moments, I basically have to go to a direction to uh, the investors to present the plan, to show where we are heading, uh, what is at that moment the, the prognosed financial result. Mm-hmm. Uh, and during any of those three moments, they can basically cut the project and say, okay, uh, it looks like this is going nowhere. So we're going to withdraw. Or they get the green light and we go to the next phase. We go to silver. And then they get the green light and we go to gold. And in gold, we always determine, we make the final determination. Like, okay, this is the amount of money that we're going to pay for this building owner 
in order to buy the land or buy the building. Well, this is the amount of money that we're going to offer the municipality mm-hmm. together with the whole plan eh, that we made with the architect and the design team in the tender in order to try to win the tender. Yeah. That's the side of the game. And, okay. and, yeah, and, that, and, and then it's just, of course, in the tender, it's just waiting and, and hoping that you're lucky. And that they consider your plan the best and that your offer was also the best. Yeah. Uh, and if you're with the building on it's waiting to see if it accepts. Well, you know. Okay. And maybe it's good to clarify for the listeners, like the ones that are maybe a bit less experienced might not know, but a tender is basically a competition, except that next to the architectural design, there is also a financial bid from a real estate developer or an investor so that the municipality evaluates both at the same time, right? Correct. Yeah. Usually you have also tenders where they only, uh, uh, they only look at the, the, the price or something. Mm-hmm. Those are price tenders. Usually we don't like participating in those because uh, there's always uh, some greater fool, let's say like that, that wants to pay more than you. So usually a tender uh, uh, consists of 70 or 80% quality. And they look at the architecture, they look at urbanism, sustainability, stakeholder management, those kind of things. And you need to write that down in the tender book, like 20 mm-hmm. pages, and usually have the 20% or 30% uh, offer, those are the friends. So what okay. are you willing to pay? And both uh, factors determine your chances of winning. So you have an 80, you can get 80 points for something with quality, 20 points for your price, or you maybe obtain 70 points for your quality, and your competitor obtains uh, 65 points for quality, but your competitor has 20 points in the price, and you only 12. And then you still okay. lose. You know? So yep. it's, it's always, it's usually both. And what I noticed here in the Netherlands, um, working, I mean, in this market as an urban designer, of course, is that there were quite a few very ambitious tenders that were really won over the quality scope. Like, I think municipalities now are getting very ambitious on sustainability, social inclusiveness, and all these topics, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So every year, the the tender requirements, the quality requirements in tenders become higher, Mm. which in one hand, of course, is, is cool, and it should be like that because... We are advancing also as a society, we are advancing as a sector. So we should also try to put the bar every time a bit higher. On the other hand, in the current uh, market circumstances, so at a very high interest rates, that uh, doesn't really allow an investor to, to get uh, a mortgage or to get a loan from a bank. It's really very difficult to get money for projects. Uh, construction prices are very high. And if on top of that, the quality requirements are also through the roof, in terms of sustainability, in terms of architecture, it becomes very, very difficult to uh, finally make a project feasible. Yeah. And that's the big challenge that we have. Yeah, I noticed that's a bit also why there is this uh, stigma over, over real estate developers. Like, people perceive you as the bad guys because in the end, you're the ones uh, kind of constraining the scope of the project in the eyes of the architects. But truth to be told, it's also very hard to make these projects profitable. And I think in the Netherlands, we went through quite a crisis in the last few months. Uh, that was probably part of the reason, right? Yeah, I think, well, I think part of the, the, the reason why we have a bad name is because in our sector, you have professional companies and you have less professional companies. Mm. The professional ones like form, we do everything by the book. We, we, do it. we only draw within the lines. We really we will never... Uh, break any rule, you know. But you also have uh, a lot of people that, for example, make a lot of money with a business. They sell their business for 200 million euro. And what are you going to invest your money in then? Right? Mm-hmm. Once you sell your business. So you, what you usually see when people sell a business and they have a lot of money, they invest in real estate. Yeah. Because you need to do something with that money. It needs to yield a return. Because otherwise it's just being eaten up by inflation year after year. So uh, you see a lot of unprofessional stakeholders with a lot of money entering the real estate market every year. And they surround themselves sometimes also with, yeah, let's say not the most professional real estate developers or shady figures even. They're buying up buildings and they also want to uh, develop or redevelop. But they don't have the knowledge. They don't really draw within the lines. And they get into conflicts with municipalities. And that's a small percentage of the market. But it gives the rest a bad name. Okay. Um, so that I think that's where our bad name comes from. Uh, but to be very honest, there are a lot of professional companies nowadays. Like the market became over the last decade super professional. Uh, and 
Yeah, most of the people working inside Ford have a university degree, have an architecture background, uh, or a legal or financial background. So I, I think it's it's not uh, completely fair, but it's something we have to do. Yeah. And uh, going back to the process, Derek, so there is a first quick scan. The quick scan is done internally. Then you get a green light and you have these three faces, the bronze, silver, and gold, right? And already in this um, in this phase, you already have a budget to develop the project. So normally that's a stage where you have consultants, I guess. Yeah, well, we have a lot of uh, uh, in-house consultants. So okay. Form actually is a very big company. And we have, uh, let's say, 80 people working for concept development, real estate development. But we also have the construction part. So Form can also construct. So for okay. example, if we want to make a cost calculation uh, or a prognosis, what it will cost to realize our development, we can just walk into the department of construction and ask them if they have this idea more or less with this quality or ambition level, what would it cost yeah, in this location? And they can make an assessment. Okay. And so I assume also, because you were mentioning before that at this stage, you might as well be participating into a tender. That would mean that you will still get probably an architect or a sustainability consultant on board. Are they all internal or are they also external? Now those uh, are usually external. So internally we have cost calculators and we have, uh, we have also a, a fiscal person for fiscal organizations. But everyone else, so the whole design team, we usually contact. For the okay. So we contact an architect, that's usually the first one. Together with the architect, we, we take a look at what would be the ideal design team for this specific assignment. Because if you work, for example, on a tender in Amsterdam uh, and they ask for a design in wood, for instance, uh, you might contract a different type of con uh, construction advisor or an installation advisor mm -hmm. than if it has to be done in concrete. Right? Because yep. there are specialized advisors for every type of project. So based on the tender, together with the architect, we always uh, look what could be the winning team. Which advisors are going to give us the, the edge? That will make us win, and which advisors, of course, also uh, can collaborate with the other because sometimes it, it doesn't really work, you know. Yeah. So it's something you always have to assess. Okay, so let's assume you pass gold, and you end up this acquisition phase. So basically, you either purchase the land from a private owner or a bu existing building from a private owner, or you won the tender. What happens then? Well, then you also purchase it, but then you purchase it from the public owner. The yeah. uh, well, what happens then? Then it goes, then we have another phase which is called diamond. <laughs> so, diamond. the console will go diamond. <laughs> and then it usually goes to development. Uh, what happened in the past is that then it really it, it went like a complete package to development, like good luck. But we found out over the last years that that doesn't really work because then, of course, the developers, they they don't share the same ambitions as the concept developers that start changing the plan. And so what we do nowadays is that we already involve the developer in the very early stages. So the concept developer is in the lead right, during the, the, the vendor, during the wrong sort of goal. But the developer is on board and sees all the decisions that are being made. He knows the rationale. And then usually when it goes to the developer in Diamond, the other way around, it also works. So the concept developer also stays involved for a few extra months. Mm -hmm. To see if the developer is not changing everything completely. Yeah. You know? Of course, it's not allowed. So, about uh, yeah, developers can be a bit stubborn and they want <laughs> to do things their way. And if they didn't invent it themselves, they sometimes don't like it. You know? It's the yeah. same with architects. That's very true. It's funny, like this division of concept developer and developer, I, I never. I never fully grasped. So, it's kind of nice for you to, to explain it to us. I, I feel the concept developers are a bit the dreamers. Or at least the, the ones with the big creative idea and the developers are the ones that want to bring home the, the profit or at least make sure this is viable. Exactly. That's, that's completely like it is. Like the developers, they usually look to the concept developers like they're basically kind of architects <laughs> that don't understand the business case and they're just dreamers. But okay, they need to dream because otherwise you will never win the project. Yeah. Um, and the concept developers, they look more like to the developers, like okay, but these guys, they're way too realistic. And if we put them in charge, we will never win the project because they're going to say from day one, this is not possible, this is not possible, and that's not possible. Okay. So quite interesting because then in this diamond phase, it's where you actually make the final business case, 
raise the final investment, I guess, and go into construction, right? Well, the diamond usually comes after acquiring the, the project already. Okay. So we already got the research, yeah, like you either win the tender or not, or you got to deal with the owner or not. And then the diamond phase is usually the phase where we know, okay, this was the business case that we had uh, when we made the decision to go for it during both. Now we have it, now we have the project on board, and now we need to, to look how we can optimize it, how we can optimize the business case without altering the concept, the design too much. Because yep. first of all, it's not allowed that when you win a tender, basically a promise as so a municipality, like we're going to do the project with this design and with these ambitions. So you cannot really alter it. Uh, so you're looking like within a limited scope at what are the changes that I can make that make the project better and uh, that make it optimized and financial. Okay. And um, in this case, how long does it take from the, the initial phase, the quick scan, all the way to the diamond phase or the start of the diamond phase? Um, yeah, three, four months, usually. Three, uh, it depends four months. On the, yeah, it, dep it depends obviously on the project. But most tenders are, uh, and I'm talking then about the, uh, the final phase of the tender, you always mm -hmm. pre selection. It can already take a month or two. And then you have the final phase, the okay. finish phase, we call it in Dutch. So once you make it through the pre selection, you're going to the final phase. Then that phase you have gold, silver, gold, internally here. That phase usually takes around three months. But if it's a super big project, you sometimes have these enormous projects that work on my answer. It can take also six to twelve months. You know? Okay. So it depends on the stuff. Uh, and then after you you know the result, if you acquire it or not, if you uh -huh. want it or not, then the diamond phase starts. And that phase is usually relatively short, one or two months. So okay. it's a few meetings, let's see how we can optimize things within the boundaries. And then it goes to, uh, to real estate development to further work out. Okay, but I, I can really imagine from, especially in the last three or four years, like in, in six to nine months, a lot can happen. Like the price of construction material can happen, inflation can can change. Um, also, I mean, mortgage rates vary. How do you handle that? Because it might be that your Excel files, file with, with all the business case looks beautiful in quick scan and uh, it goes through all the different uh, silver, bronze, gold, etc. And then when you get to diamond, everything changed around you and that cannot go further. What happens then? Yeah, that depends per project. But of course, we have to deal with this. Right? Over the last uh, uh, two years, we've seen enormous changes in the market. Mm. The, the interest rates going up is really, that's the toughest one. Because in the end, uh, we as a developer, we have a little bit of our money. But we don't have unlimited money. So when we do a project, we usually or get a, a loan to a bank. Yeah. Or we do uh, what is called forward funding. So forward funding for maybe the, the listeners that don't know what it is, is imagine we develop a building with 100 apartments, and they are all rental apartments. Those apartments will be bought by an institutional investor, like a pension fund or an insurance okay. company. They buy those as an investment because a pension fund, they need to pay every month to the retired people pension. Yeah. And that money, that needs to generate a little bit of profit every year. Otherwise, they will not be able to pay the pension. It's just important. Yeah. So, uh, the pension fund might buy those 100 apartments. And through forward funding, it's a concept that they already pay before construction starts. Mm -hmm. Because if they pay at the end of construction, once we deliver the building to them, to the apartments, it means mm -hmm. we have to finance ourselves the whole construction. Yeah. And construction of 100 apartments can be a very expensive uh, thing. It costs 50 million euro. Yeah. So the, uh, we are always looking to acquire uh, money, loans. The loan could be or from a bank or from a pension fund that does forward funding. So when the pension fund or the insurance company does forward funding, what basically happens is that they are financing our construction during two or three years. And they cannot use that money to invest it in something else. Because normally they would maybe buy stocks, or they would buy something else. So they want to have a return also on that money. And now that the interest rates went up a lot, yeah, so you hear the, the screens go down automatically, so now the light Yeah, yeah. It. For those that are watching but, the video, it went yeah. dark in Derek's room. Yeah, it went dark, but now it looks a bit lighter. So. Okay. Um, so they, they want some money, some return of that money, and now that the interest rates went up from well, basically zero to four or five percent, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you want to have a loan from the bank for a commercial project, it could be six to seven percent even, 
Wow. Because they look at the early boy and then they put on top uh, a risk uh, mm-hmm. a profile. Yeah, that, that's the same amount of interest that we have to pay to the pension fund. So it's also 6 to 7% during those years in the forward fund. So that makes it already more difficult because in the past we, we hardly paid interest. And now we pay all, over all those years an interest on top of those 50 or 100 million euros can be a lot of money. It makes yeah. business, case, business case very more difficult. And Derek, I imagine like you're very constrained when it comes to projects. Like this, this financial framework forces you to, of course, as a concept developer, being the dreamer of the team, but still kind of keeping it realistic and grounded. Um, that might limit innovation, of course, because whenever you want to finance or fund something innovative, the costs go over the roof and it's very hard to make it profitable. Do you guys develop some programs or some uh, projects where you decide, okay, this is going to be an innovative project. Maybe we lose money here, but we invest in research and for other stuff, we stay a bit more on track. Yeah, yeah we do. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have also boring projects, let's say like that. We are not only doing high rises or super complex projects, we also do normal detached houses. Uh, and those ones are, are quite easy to make. So we have standardized designs. Uh, basically, the architect only has maybe the, the, the freedom to design the facade, but everything else is completely engineered. So on those type of houses, we have quite a stable profit margin. Um, and we have the more sensitive projects. We also want to do inner city developments. Mm-hmm. projects are extremely complex and we are sometimes willing for a few projects to say okay you know if this one doesn't yield, yield the profit that's fine because this is really like a learning curve for uh, our company it's the first time for example that we do uh, a building in wood or it's the mm-hmm. first time that we make a building of 200 meters high that's like a learning process we're willing to to really reduce the profit margin or even accept no profit in the project okay but you cannot do that, of course, with too many projects, because in the end, we as a company, we need, we need to pay our bills. We need to yeah. pay our taxes, our bills, our employees. So uh, that's very limited. Yeah, yeah, of course. Is that your R&D or there is also an R&D department that researches new stuff, more sustainable construction methods and so on? Well, we don't really have an R&D department, but we have um, under the, the holding, so phone is a holding, so it's basically a mother company, mm-hmm. mother entity. We have 16 different entities. Okay. So we have an entity for development, for construction, for renovation, transformation. But we also have an uh, innovation department nowadays. We have uh, a wood learning, it's called. So it's a yeah, department that really researches construction wood. So every time that we come up with an innovation or with an idea, we try to create a new company under the mother company. Okay. And that new company then grows and attracts more employees, grows, has new projects. and and really works it out and has a certain budget, you know. So we yeah. don't work with one R&D uh, department, we work with different innovations that go their own way in different companies. Well, that's quite interesting. Also because if you are the ones building projects at the end of the day, it's also quite useful that this type of innovation gets tested inside the company, then it's expertise that you can directly implement. And how do architects play a role in that? Do you sometimes commission or collaborate with architects on innovation projects as well? Yeah, really good. So, for example, um, we have a, an entity which is called Boot Boost, and it basically means a boost for the neighborhood. Um, and what we do is that you have a lot of existing buildings in the Netherlands from the post-war period, so 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, uh, usually social rent. Mm-hmm. And in those neighborhoods, the percentage of social rent is very high, and it creates uh, certain exclusion problems, kids. Mm-hmm. Rent. They only they stay in their own environment. They don't know kids, maybe the parents that are lawyers or architects or real estate developers. So they don't see the opportunities of the world and they stay always inside that neighborhood, inside that environment, you know, which offers little opportunity. So what we're trying to do is to mix those neighborhoods with other type of housing, or an occupied or different, so and social rent. Mm-hmm. And with Good Boost, we do that by constructing on top of the existing buildings. Usually, the construction allows two or three more stories. So the construction from those eras was quite strong, actually. Yeah. Nowadays, we always calculate it. So we have to use the least amount of material, because, of course, then we save costs. But in those periods, they didn't have computers. So they yeah. always had a very high safety margin. 
And with that safety margin, it allows to construct extra layers on top, and that could be mid range, could be on our plan, or we construct against it. So you have a completely closed side of the safe, and we just construct the tower against it. Mm-hmm. By doing that, we're densifying those neighborhoods, we're adding other type of residents, we get more mix also in schools, with kids. This is called Bluetooth, and this is uh, a concept that we are doing uh, really in close collaboration with an architect. So the architect designed the, the type of pop-ups that you can put on top of the existing buildings. We have uh, modules, basically. So yeah, we do a lot of these uh, type of collabs. Okay, very interesting. I think that opens the way for my next question, which is really a lot more about um, how do you see the collaboration between real estate developers and architects in the future? Like, what do you think are the useful services architects can bring to the table? Uh, yeah, well, I think what I mentioned earlier, I think the, the, the strong asset or the strong quality of an architect is that it can be the ambassador of an idea towards mm-hmm. our external stakeholders, towards maybe the neighborhood, towards municipalities. And they do that way better than a real estate developer because mm-hmm. they have a way better image. Architects are usually dreamers, so they can present it in a very nice way. They use very nice language. We real estate developers are in the end. We, that's what I said, we are generalists, we're not specialists. So we li- know a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. But we, we cannot express, for example, the design and the project in such a way that an architect does. So the, the presenting and the stakeholder management is super important. It's really vital for an architect. Um, and the architect, in my eyes, is also the extension of the developer that translates the ideas and the boundaries that the, that the developer gives into a, an idea for the entire design team. Yeah. Yeah? It's, your, it's your partner in the design team that leads the rest of the, of the, of the pack. Yeah? Let's mm-hmm. say like that. Yeah. I think, and I think that's the, the, the future role, the current role, but also the future role of an architect. And do you see... Um, big trends in the industry. Like I make an example, we we had our first episode with the um, with the president of the European Council of Architects, and they released a sector study where we basically went through each industry. Turns out that housing is the biggest of all services in the market. So far, is that most of architectural services are put into design for housing projects. Yeah. Uh, do you think, I mean, that's still the case? Is going to be the case in the coming 10 years? And besides yeah. that, if there is also more challenges or more opportunities coming up in the industry? I think it's still going to be the case. Uh, because okay. uh, if you just look at uh, demography, uh, and I'm talking then uh, especially for the Netherlands, the population of the Netherlands is growing fast. So uh, the Netherlands has quite a high birth rate if you compare it, for example, to southern European countries, like yeah. Portugal, Spain, Italy. Even though the, the, only the birth rate, uh, without immigration, the population would be declining but just a little bit, not a lot. But we also have a lot of immigration. So uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, yeah, political or war refugees, but that's only a small percentage because yeah. most people coming to the Netherlands, they really come to work. Uh, you have people that maybe work uh, on the land or in the greenhouses. We also have a lot of knowledge workers, a lot of experts. In, in any architecture firm, you know it, in the Netherlands, I think at least half of the uh, employees come from different countries. I can they don't confirm, come from the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and all these people, they need housing. Mm-hmm. So we have an enormous shortage of housing in the Netherlands already at this moment. I think the current number is like we lack three or 400,000 houses. And if immigration stays this high and we keep uh, attracting people to come and work in the Netherlands because the demand is high, we're always looking for new people. Then, of course, we also need to construct houses for those people. That's one. And then another trend that you see is that in the past, people used to work five days per week in the office. And now there are a lot of people, if I look at my own wife, for example, she goes only two days per week to the office. Yeah. And the rest she works from home, and all her colleagues do the same. So your home becomes more important even. Because it's not only the place where you sleep or where you, you, you watch Netflix, but it's also the place where maybe you spend a lot of working hours. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so that's also a challenge for architects. How can you make the home in such a way that it can suit all those different purposes? Um, so I think housing is, is, is vital. And you see, for example, uh, office space, there is demand, but it's very little. Because yeah. you see actually a lot of office space being converted to housing. 
And the office spaces that are in demand are the new office spaces, the sustainable office spaces with big floors, a lot of greenery, uh, very high energy levels. But all those old office buildings with bad energy levels, uh, little daylight, they are not attractive anymore for yeah. tenants. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the big challenge is in housing, definitely, for the coming decades. And uh, if I hear you right, also, building transformations could be an opportunity. Like, how do you handle these old buildings in the inner city rather than building new ones, right? Yeah, yeah definitely, because in the end, um, converting an existing building into a different function is always more sustainable than just tearing it down and constructing something new. Mm-hmm. Unless, of course, the current building is very small and only has, let's say, three floors. And the new building that you're proposing there has 50 floors. Then, of course, it's a different story and you can mix way more functions and way more people in a tiny plot. Yeah. Uh, but usually, uh, I think it's, it's crucial to always look, what can I do with the existing building? And does it suit the transformation? And if so, then you should maybe up. Okay. Um, Derek, one last question. The same that I ask every guest when we wrap up the episode. And that is, what advice would you give to someone that is practicing architecture today or that is about to start a career in architecture? What would you tell them? This is maybe not what uh, architects or uh, future architects want to hear, but I would say uh, only pursue a career in architecture if you really love it, if you have passion for it, and if you think you have talent. Because, for example, uh, if I relate to myself, I also studied architecture. And I studied architecture because I wanted to become an architect. But I found out after two or three weeks in my studies that I was a terrible architect. <laughs> I, had, yeah, I had sometimes good ideas, but I had no clue how to translate them to paper. And uh, also I couldn't present them as a good way as, as a real good architects can. So I saw a lot of boys and girls that were way more talented than me. Uh, but I did like it. I, did, I, I like architecture and I like developing something. I like also the financial and the legal side. So I immediately thought, okay, what can I do? That suits me a bit better, but I can still keep working in the sector. And in the end, that was really the study better. So, if you study architecture and you don't really have the ultimate passion and you don't consider yourself super gifted or talented, then know that there are also a lot of other possibilities. And you can be a real estate developer, you can work as an investment manager in real estate. There's so many different options, uh, and you can still work in the sector, but never forget it. And what if then someone, after listening to your advice, thinks, Oh, actually, you know what? Maybe I want to shift a bit closer to development. What are the first necessary steps? Like, is there training, education, or other activities that they could take on to, you know, to move in that direction? Yeah, there are, for sure, there are trainings, uh, there are studies or courses. Uh, yeah, for example, in the Netherlands, you have the NAPROM, that is, uh, it, it's a course, basically, about real estate development. Uh, but I think the best would simply be to, um, to have interviews with a development companies. You could just go there and maybe call them and say, hey, are you looking for a real estate developer? I have a background in architecture, but I wouldn't mind uh, trying to work as a real estate developer for a few years. Are there any possibilities? I mean, you need to be assertive, proactive. Mm-hmm. They will not come to you. You maybe have to get to come yourself. That's one. Uh, and two, you could also call a headhunter. I mean, nowadays, a lot of people, they get job offers. So they don't have to go to a company, they get job offers to a headhunter. So just call the headhunter and say, hey, I'm an architect, but actually I have uh, proper financial knowledge. I know quite a bit about how it works. I would love to work in uh, real estate development. So please, if you see any opportunity, uh, take me into account. Okay. So if I hear you right, there is first acquiring a bit of knowledge so that you are not completely clueless of, of the job. That would be nice, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then second, be proactive, reach out. I was thinking yeah. you were mentioned that you have architects in house. I can really imagine that for them it's a lot easier to make the transition because they're already in that environment. So it would also be cool to have an entry job that is a bit closer to your profession and in time move on, no? Completely. So uh, uh, even inside development, of course, you have different uh, subsectors. Yeah. Yeah, for example, concept development. Concept development is quite close to architecture. And you're really together with the design team making the screen to win the tender or. Uh, yeah. To acquire the project and you need to know a little bit about uh, finances because you need to be able to make a business case but you don't need to control the business case and really go through the project and do also cost cost management yeah 
So that's a very nice first step. And if you get bored after a few years, you can always move to us. Wow, this was an amazing crash course. I loved it. It was a very useful yes. episode. Thank you so much, Derek. That's nice. Yeah, it was nice to hear. So we're back from our talk with Derek. And as the title promised, it was an amazing crash course on real estate. I really enjoyed it. In every episode, we have this little tradition of taking a minute after every conversation to explore or brainstorm an idea for a boundary-breaking business model that architects could apply to their own practice. Here is the one from this week. A parametric architect. So actually, I have to come clean. This idea is from Derek. We stayed after our conversation and I asked him, hey, what could be an interesting business model that we could share with our audience? And he said, actually today for the quick scan, for the, um, for the early stages of the project, we don't really need to go to an architect anymore. There is digital platforms or digital tools that can do this job. And many architecture firms in the Netherlands, he mentioned a few names, which I will not share, but they already have these tools available. For them, it's a matter of one or two clicks and all the know-how they gathered over the years gets processed in a parametric platform and gets quick photometric studies, indicators, numbers. This is a very valuable business opportunity. So you could turn your expertise into a service that is digitally accessed and sell it potentially to real estate developers. So they don't have to commission consultancies every time, but you could actually you know, make this um, software as a service kind of option. And on top of that, you could still add extra consultancy services after this uh, first approach is done through the platform. In other words, if they buy your software and they use your software internally, you have a recurring revenue. On top of that, you could offer services of consultancy. They want something specific. They want you to tailor and tweak parameters. They pay you extra. They want an architect to develop these models into a specific design that is presentable to municipalities in the way that Derek outlined. You could do that. You could offer that as an extra. So at the end of the day, it's not anymore acquiring projects that we architects would do in the past knocking the doors, getting a commission, doing the commission, end of story. You would rather be having a service running and on top of that service, selling extra expertise. Another option, and that was my initial idea, I'll just drop it there, is that architects could also start playing developers. On a small scale, that's something that could be done. I think Derek explained how a huge company such as Form is operating, but you could imagine that you could do this on a small scale, one single housing unit or stuff like that. So I hope you enjoyed, I hope this was insightful and whatever idea you have, as usual, I encourage you to reach out. The channels are Known A on LinkedIn and Known A Podcasts on Instagram. And whatever platform you're using right now, stop for a second, hit a follow, rate us, give us a like, thumbs up, whatever it is, just show your support. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next week. Beyond Architecture is a non-A podcast. This episode has been developed with the financial support of the Dutch Creative Industries Fund. Editorial support and marketing for non-A, Marco Mattia Cristofori, Daniela Silva, and Francisco Rivera. Sound supervision by Daniel van der Poppe for Sprach Market Media. Advisory, Max Augustijn, Martine Chloe van der Bowman, Francesco De Stefano, and Anne Bruna. I'm Luca De Stefano, your host, and this was Beyond Architecture.